Uh, so you should all hear. So this event can then be shared with lots of people who want to see it later. So firstly, hello and welcome to the Women and Girls in Science event at the Open University. Uh, we're delighted to have so many of you here joining us from all around the country. Uh, I'm Dr. Alice Dunford, and I'm going to be very pleased to introduce you to some incredible scientists who I worked with at the Open University based in Milton Keynes. So for those of you, those of you who don't know, university is the next step after secondary education. Uh, it's where you go to study a subject that you're really passionate about or something you might want to go into a job afterwards. But it's also the place where we do a lot of research and really groundbreaking research sort of discoveries are made. So today we're going to be hearing about some of that exciting research that goes on uh, and how these scientists got into science and why they chose this path. And then we're going to open it up. We're going to open it up to your questions. We've already had a lot of questions come through and we're looking forward to hopefully some more coming through in the chat. What you'll see is no one's got any cameras on apart from our speakers uh, and all the chat will only be directed to me for safeguarding. But if you've got any questions, make sure to ask, them, ask your teacher to put them in the chat for us. And I'm going to then hand over to Carol. We're still getting some people joining us, uh, but I'm going to hand over to Carol to give her introduction for her section, if that's OK. Uh, Thank you, Alice. So hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah. OK, so what we wanted to do in this in this short session was just to give you a little bit of a flavour of what we do in our jobs doing science. And maybe a lot of you think, oh, I don't know anything about science. But actually, I think that probably most of you are sort of experts already, because what we do as scientists is we mess around with things and we see what happens. And that's how we work out how the world works, or in my case, because I'm an astronomer, how the universe works. And of course, that's exactly what children do when they play. So I think probably all of you actually are scientists already. And what we want to do is to persuade you that you might want to continue being a scientist as you grow up, because it can be a lot of fun. So this slide is about how I chose my job. And I grew up in a place called Redcar, which is on Teesside. And I think there might be at least one school who might recognize the pictures on the left-hand side here. So there's a beach, it's Redcar Beach, and there's a very famous bridge in Middlesbrough there. And in 1969, I was standing on Redcar Beach with my dad, and he pointed up at the moon and said, there are people walking around on the moon. And this was when the very first moon landing took place. So at that point, I was six years old and it was obvious to me that by far the best job to have would be to be an astronaut. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, however, as you can see, I wear glasses and actually I never really saw anything very well until I was 10 years old when people realized that I needed glasses. And at that point, it meant that I couldn't be an astronaut because you had to be basically perfect to be an astronaut at that time. If any of you would like to be astronauts and you wear glasses, you don't need to worry because space flights come on a long way and now you can be an astronaut and wear glasses. Um, but it's probably a bit late for me because I'm quite old now. So I chose my job because I realized I couldn't be an, astro uh, uh, an astronaut and astronomy seemed like the next best thing. And I've had lots and lots of fun doing astronomy. And basically what I do is use big telescopes. So on the left there, there's a picture of me in front of a big telescope, which is in South America. So I get to travel to other continents to go to beautiful mountaintops and use the equipment there. And what I do is collect light from stars and analyze that light to look for planets that are orbiting around other stars. And the other picture that you can see there is a telescope in space. And it's an artist's impression, just sort of trying to, to show how we might find planets orbiting around other stars or so finding other solar systems with planets perhaps like the Earth. Um, so we have lots and lots of fun doing this. And you might think, what on earth has this got to do with astronomy? Well, one of the things uh, that 
is used to protect the telescope I just showed you that I was standing in front of is there's a webcam pointing up at the sky so that the astronomers who are indoors can see if there are clouds coming and there might be rain about to land on the telescope. So this webcam looks up at the sky and this is a picture of a beautiful South American bird of prey, a condor, which is absolutely huge. And it came and sat on the webcam. So this is a picture from below of a South American bird of prey. So I'm going to stop there and pass over to our next speaker. That was brilliant. That, I'll just pass over to Joe then, if that's okay. Oh, Joe, I think you're muted as well. Sorry, it's, I can't actually see what you can. I'm actually, yes, I am sharing the right screen. Sorry, yep. it's, it's gone. There we go. That's more like it. I assume you can see what you're supposed to be able to see at this point. Great. Um, so uh, I'm Joe Barstow. I am an Ernest Rutherford Research Fellow, which is a fancy way of saying I get to spend pretty much all of my time at work um, looking at stuff in space. Um, I'm also an astronomer like Carol. When I'm not at work, as you can see, I have my hands full at the moment because I've got two little girls at home. Um, and I also look at planets like Carol, but I started off my career um, a little bit closer to home. I started looking at the planets in our solar system. So those are the ones that go around our sun. Actually, to start with, um, it, I looked at Mars when I was um, 16. I spent a few weeks of my summer holiday from school working at the University of Leicester with a group of scientists who, were, who had developed a spacecraft called Beagle 2 that was going to go and land on Mars and um, sit on the surface and sample um, the air around it, sample the soil and try and find out, amongst other things, if Mars had ever hosted alien life. Now, unfortunately, that particular spacecraft um, didn't land quite perfectly and wasn't able to complete its mission. But even though it didn't work out particularly well for Beagle 2, it did mean that I decided I really, really wanted to spend my career looking at other planets. So this um, is a planet that might look a little bit boring um, to many of you. It's not very colourful, kind of looks a bit like an egg or a pearl. Um, this planet is Venus and it is probably the most similar of the other planets in our solar system to the Earth. Um, it's not that similar, despite the fact that it looks rather peaceful and serene in this photograph, it's actually pretty hellish when you get down to the surface. It's very, very, very hot um, and what gives it that rather sort of beautiful pearlescent shade is um, the clouds coverage on Venus. So Venus is completely covered in clouds all the time. Um, there's no such thing as a sunny day on Venus. And those clouds are not made of droplets of water like the clouds that we know. They're made of a rather nasty chemical called sulfuric acid. Acid is stuff that can sort of eat away and dissolve things. So Venus is actually a very unpleasant place to be. Um, and one of the things that we would really love to find out when we study planets is why Venus ended up being so, so, so horrible and why Earth ended up being really quite a nice place for people and rabbits and insects and all the, all the other things that live on Earth to be. So this is Earth, um, this is a really, a really impressive picture actually and the reason that I like this picture so much is it's not a picture taken by a, a spacecraft this is a picture taken by a person on a spacecraft so this was a photograph taken by a member of the Apollo 11 crew on one of NASA's moon missions um, but you can really see um, all of the amazing um, complexity in the patterns that you see in our atmosphere. So what you're looking at, those white patches, they're clouds. And you can see from the shape of the clouds what the air is doing on the planet. You can see the directions it's moving in. Um, and we actually do use satellites to look at the Earth to tell us more about the planet that we live on. So satellites, when we say a satellite, we mean a spacecraft that's been launched and 
Um, in the case of an Earth satellite, it's a satellite that just goes around and around the Earth and looks down. We've also sent satellites to look at other planets. Um, so this is a, a picture of Jupiter. This is probably one of the most recognizable planets in the solar system. And again, what we're looking at on this planet, we're not looking at the surface, we're looking at clouds again. So all of these colors are different types of cloud. We still don't really understand actually what gives these clouds their colors. And you'll notice that there's a very obvious round sort of orangey red spot um, to the lower right hand side of the picture that's called rather unimaginatively the great red spot. And it's a storm. It's a storm that has been raging ever since we started using telescopes to look at Jupiter. And that storm is bigger than the whole of the Earth, just to give you an idea of the different scales of these planets. This is an, um, a picture of Saturn, but it's again, it's not a, your typical picture of Saturn. You can see the rings, but this was a very, very special picture taken of Saturn by a spacecraft called Cassini. And during its mission, Cassini went around to the side of Saturn on the opposite side from the sun. So in this picture, the sun is behind Saturn um, and it's being blocked by Saturn, but it's lighting up Saturn's rings from behind, which is why they look so, so beautiful and glowy. You can really see how big they are, how massive the rings are compared to Saturn. But the really nice thing about this image is if you zoom in to the bottom right corner, there's a little tiny blue dot and that is us. That's the Earth and the Moon together. You can't see them separately because they're so, so, so far away from the spacecraft. Now, like Carol mentioned, what we're doing now is actually trying to look at planets that orbit other stars. And if, if you can't even see the Moon and the Earth apart from each other from the distance of Saturn, just imagine how difficult it is to spot a planet next to another star way out in space. But we can do it and we do it by waiting for the planet to pass in between its star and us and block a tiny little bit of the starlight so that we can infer the planet is there. We can use this technique, um, just measuring the amount of light coming from a star and seeing how it changes to actually find out an awful lot of things about planets. And this is a planet that we have, have looked at um, for quite a long time. It doesn't have a very interesting name. It's called HD 189733b. And the only reason I remember it is because I've spent so long studying it. But even though we, we can't point a spacecraft, we can't point a telescope at this planet and take a picture, all we can do is look at the total amount of light coming from the star and the planet together. But despite that, we've actually been able to determine the color of this planet. We know that if we could go and see it, it would be a rather nice shade of blue, just like Neptune. And guess what? We also know that it has clouds. Clouds seem to get everywhere. So if you imagine um, an alien civilization somewhere way out in the galaxy, they probably moan about the weather just as much as we do. I'll pass on now to, I think, is it Elena next? Okay, hi everyone. Uh, let me share my screen here. My name is Elena Favreau and I am a planetary scientist, which means I get to spend my days looking at Mars behind me. Um, what's a really big part of my job uh, right now is I'm a member of the European Space Agency's ExoMars mission. So that's a mission that's going to be launching um, in September, actually, sometime between September and early October. And we're uh, sending uh, a rover about the size of a golf cart um, all, the way, all the way to Mars. Uh, as you can see here, it's a pretty impressive looking uh, laboratory on wheels but I'm just jumping you're not you're not sharing at the moment I can't see it I oh I'm it. sorry I says I'm sharing here uh Kate let me try that again still not sharing how about now now it's we're sharing yeah. okay well I'm sorry but now sorry about that now we can see the really impressive uh laboratory on wheels um so I am mostly concerned with this instrument right here uh, at the top, if you can't see my cursor. Um, this is the PanCam camera, and it allows or will allow scientists back on Earth uh, to take really beautiful pictures 
of the surface of Mars. And I'm the type of uh, scientist and researcher who looks at those pictures and tries to understand how that how that landscape came to be. Is there a rock there? How did that rock get there? How long has that rock been there? Uh, is there is there some sort of um, some sort of ditch uh, that might have had water in it? If so, how long ago was that water there? Why is that stream in the place that you see it and not somewhere else? So I get to uh, I basically get to think about how things on Mars evolved and why they look the way they do. Now, this is a pretty sophisticated camera, uh, a lot more sophisticated than the ones uh, that you might have at home or your parents have on their phones. Um, there's a couple of cameras here. We have, let's put on the laser pointer. We've got a couple of cameras here on the left and the right. And these will take really beautiful, large panoramic pictures of Mars that then we can put in a, in a computer and make 3D models of. So that's pretty exciting. And then we have this camera here, a high resolution camera. And not only do these cameras take pictures like we might see with, uh, with our eyes, uh, they also take pretty impressive scientific photos. So here's a picture uh, that you might, you might recognize. Uh, maybe you don't know exactly where this is, but you, know, you see things that you recognize as this photo. And PanCam is gonna be able to go and take pictures that look like this. And so uh, all of these different colors tell us all sorts of really uh, interesting and important information. And so I'm part of the team that will be taking both kinds of photos and part of the team that when it comes all the way back to Earth from all the way at Mars, uh, that we're going to sit down uh, as a group of scientists and we're going to try to figure out what it is we're looking at and, um, and hopefully tell uh, all the people back here on Earth something that they didn't know about about the surface of Mars. Um, here is just a quick video of what the Mars rover is going to look like and how it might move on Mars. This is in a test facility in France. And right now that rover is trying to get over all of this sand. So the kind of sand you might see uh, in your school playgrounds, in sandboxes, or sand pits. Um, I am the kind of scientist that's really interested in what this sand is and why it's there and these rocks and why they're there. Um, but they sometimes get in the way of the rover and we certainly don't want the rover to get stuck. So the engineers have built it in such a way that the wheels sort of move independent of each other uh, and we'll be able to get out of these sand traps um, should they get stuck. So we're, we're very excited about the science that we're gonna be able to do and the sophistication of the rover. Uh, and we hope that it's uh, a long and, and successful mission. So I will leave it there. I'm gonna to try to end the slideshow. Let's see if that works. Uh, and I will pass it over to Annie. Did I end it? No, I didn't. Now I did, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. Give me a second while I also share my screen. Okay, are we all seeing that? Lovely, okay, so um, I'll talk to you a little bit about what uh, I'm involved in. Um, for me, that project is mapping Mercury. So we have on the right here, a picture of Mercury's globe. You'll notice it looks quite similar to our moon. It's got a lot of craters and it's a really fascinating planet. I've got it next to a picture of just the Earth. I'm sure you all recognize that one. Like I'm sure many of us here, um, my love for uh, geology and for space science started a lot closer to home. It started on Earth. Um, I grew up in Scotland where I was surrounded by amazing mountains and beaches and, and all these beautiful natural things. And I, it, it's always just made me think, how did they get here? Why are they here? And that's one of the key things about thinking like a scientist is having a bit of curiosity about the world around you. So that led me to studying Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but it's there right next to the sun. Perfect. 
Um, you'll see some of the other planets have been spoken about today. Um, Joe showed us that picture of Venus at the very start. Elena was talking about Mars. Here we are on Earth with the Moon, and there's Mercury. Um, like Venus, it's not a very happy planet to live on, <laughs> and that's a lot to do because it's so close to the Sun. Uh, the temperatures it gets uh, during the daytime are hotter than 430 degrees, which is just scorching. And then at night, it gets so cold that it's minus 180. So we have this massive range of temperatures on the surface of the planet. So uh, I'm looking at the geology, and that really means the rock that we can see on Mercury. Um, so we, to be able to work out what the geology is, uh, I need to have images of the planet. So here I've got a video of some of the images we have. And I think, I hope you agree, it's just a stunning planet. You know, we've got all these craters. Many of them have really bright, brilliant ejector rays coming from them. And then these yellowy red patches, those are actually um, old lavas. So that at one point was molten lava that then cooled to form rock. So it's my job to, to work out what is a lava, what's a crater, and how they relate to each other. So how do we do that? Well, it all starts with an image like this. This is the surface of Mercury. And actually, my job is really just colouring in. <laughs> so it's something that you can all do. Um, the first stage is to make the lines because we want to colour in between the lines. Uh, in this case, the lines are uh, rims of craters or other mountain or cliff-like features. They're all the lines that we start with. And then when we produce the map, we colour that all in and make something that makes sense scientifically. Um, so here's we have an example of that. Now for Mercury, this needs to be done before 2024 because there's a mission already en route. It's called Bepi Colombo and it arrives at Mercury in 2024. So my map has to be finished before Bepi Colombo gets there. So I've got a, a tight time scale to finish that in. Now, my area that I'm concentrating on on Mercury is the South Pole, so right at the bottom of the planet. Uh, and it's a really interesting area. We have this big crater right in the center of it. And actually, it, um, it's in permanent darkness. It never sees the sunlight. And it means that temperatures there are constantly at around minus 150 to 170 degrees. So really cold. And actually, we know that ice is held in the bottom of that. So we know ice is on Mercury, which was a really exciting discovery. But I'm going to draw your attention there to that um, crater I've highlighted in this box. This is a crater that I'm studying. Here we go, it's a close up of it. Um, it's a crater that I'm studying, but it's also a crater that I got to name, which was incredibly exciting for me. Um, on Mercury, craters are named after artists. So it can be painters or sculptors or singers or anything like that. Uh, I named this crater the Nairn Crater after Lady Carolina Nairn, who was a Scottish poet. And I think it's really important that I've named it after her because in her lifetime, she was a lady and it wasn't proper for a lady to also be a poet. So she was never allowed to publish her poems under her own name. And um, so her success didn't really come about until until after her death, when when we realized how many poems she wrote. Um, so I'm quite I'm quite happy now that she's represented on Mercury. Uh, I have some websites that I can pass on to the schools to to give you an opportunity to explore Mercury yourself. But that's what I do in my my job in science. That was brilliant, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, before we start with questions, I'm going to ask the teachers a favour. If you're in a classroom, could the teachers possibly add into the chat the number of pupils you've got in your class? So we'd have a good idea of how many people we've got with us from around the country. And we're going to start off with the first question that we've got coming in. And I think it's a really good one to start because we've got lots of exciting scientists here and we're hoping these scientists are going to inspire you to go off and be interested in science. But I would like to know who inspired you to go into science and who was your favourite or, or who was your favourite scientist? And that'd be really interesting. Shall we start with Annie, who's just spoken? 
Of course. Um, so I think one of the scientists that inspired me most was called Hedy Lamarr. Um, she was responsible for developing the technology that allowed us to have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. She was an incredible scientist, um, but she was also incredibly talented in the arts. She was an actress and she was told by her government that she um, was worth more to them as an actress. And they kind of tried to stop her pursuing her life in science. And it's only for her passion for the subject that she continued to do it. Um, she didn't have all that much support. So I find that incredibly inspiring. Perhaps less um, glamorous, there's another scientist I'd like to mention called um, Maria Gordon, who was from a similar area in Scotland and who did a lot of work on fossils. So she's less glamorous, but a very important figure in my life because I find her incredibly relatable. Carol, you're next on my screen. Do you want to go next? Yeah, so um, my favourite scientist is Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And at about the time that people were walking on the moon for the first time, she was a PhD student studying at the University of Cambridge. And she found something um, that was really exciting. So at the end of the lifetime of a star like the sun, it runs out of fuel at its center. So the sun is changing hydrogen atoms into helium atoms, and that generates a lot of energy, and that holds the sun up. And when the sun runs out of fuel at its center, it will collapse into a much, much smaller object. And we know that the sun will become something called a white dwarf. But if you had a star that was, say, five or six times more massive than the sun, it had five or six times as much stuff in it, as the sun has, it actually collapses all the way down to the density of an atomic nucleus. And so the entire star is only then about as big as you know, a city. So the whole of the star would fit within the M25, which goes around London. And these stars are called neutron stars. And Jocelyn Bell Burnell found the first signs of them. So as the star collapses, like an ice skater, if they, if they start spinning and pull their arms in, they start spinning faster and faster and faster. And that happens as the star collapses. So you end up with this very dense object that's spinning incredibly quickly. And as it does that, it sends out radio waves. So back in the 1960s, Jocelyn Bell Burnell was working looking at the sky with radio telescopes and found these objects that had these regular pulses that went beep, 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 but really, really quickly. So thousands of times a second. And at first she thought this could be little green men, aliens sending us radio signals. Um, but it turned out it was just a natural phenomenon. It was a collapsed star, which we call a neutron star or a pulsar because it, it sends these radio signals. And Jocelyn has been an incredibly inspiring figure, not just scientifically, but in terms of her sort of personal generosity. So uh, quite recently, a few years ago, she was awarded a really major prize for this discovery that she made decades ago. And so she was awarded millions of pounds of money. And rather than spending that on buying a really lovely house and fast cars and things, what she's done is to establish a charity which supports young women who wouldn't be able to afford easily to go to university and continue their studies to actually pay for all their expenses to do that. So Jocelyn Bell Burnell is by far my favourite astronomer. And she also used to be the head of department here at the Open University, but she isn't anymore. I think both uh, Joe as well, I can know that would be, well, they'll say as well, all of us were very excited whenever we met Jocelyn at work. Um, so I think it's always a very exciting moment when we see her. Joe, do you want to go next? Yes, so I'm very annoyed with Carol because she stole Jocelyn from me. <laughs> I would have, she got there first. Um, so I'm going to mention a lady called Caroline Herschel. And she lived um, towards the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. So um, 
you know, about 200 years ago. She was the sister of a, a probably more famous at the time, at least, astronomer called William Herschel, who founded the society that many astronomers in the UK are members of called the Royal Astronomical Society. But she worked um, alongside him. Um, she made a huge number of discoveries too. She discovered um, that she discovered a number of comets and other objects in the sky. And she was the first woman to be awarded the gold medal, which is one of the most um, prestigious awards from the Royal Astronomical Society at a time when women really didn't do this sort of thing. Um, the other reason I find her quite interesting is that both she and her brother were also very, very musical and um, she was a singer and I'm also a singer. So um, I find there's a bit of common ground there. Brilliant, thank you, Joe. And I'm gonna pass over to Eleanor as well, if that's okay. Yeah, so uh, a scientist that I really look up to is Roberta Bondar. Uh, she was the first Canadian woman in space. Uh, she was also the first girl guide in space. Uh, I, I am a girl guide, uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. She was able to bring a box of um, Canadian girl guide biscuits with her uh, into space, and they ate those as they orbited, orbited the Earth. Um, Interest, really interestingly, is um, Roberta Bondar lives only a couple blocks away from where my family lives in Toronto, uh, in Canada. She actually lives in the house that my father lived in before he moved. So uh, it was always a really interesting um, little piece of information that I had, uh, but also I really came to admire her, her tenacity and her education. She's a, she's a, she has a PhD, which is a really, really high degree that you can get even after you go to university. She's a medical doctor. Um, she's a pretty remarkable woman. So that's who that's who I looked up to. They are all incredible scientists. I think for me personally, I would just jump in and say Katherine Johnson is one of my favorites as well. She was a mathematician who worked for NASA um, and overcame a lot of barriers to sort of be one of the, the the, the sort of the basis of a lot of the space work that went on and she helped calculate um, a lot of the, the the orbit patterns for the scientists to sort of go out and use later so I think there's a lot of incredible scientists out there and we've literally just touched the surface I think anyone anyone else has us to name probably five more people who would inspire us as well now we've got lots of questions coming in and we've got a lot to get through we've got about 10 10 minutes to do so so I'm going to jump on Carol, I'm going to ask you this one because it's from Newton. Um, and I suppose this is, um, it says what it was the first planet discovered, but I'm going to adapt it. What was the first exoplanet that was discovered? Um, okay, so, so you've introduced a new word there. I have. Uh, exoplanet means that it's a planet, but instead of orbiting around our sun, it's orbiting around another star. Um, so obviously the first planet discovered would be the Earth, um, because people were walking around on it before they even really knew that they were walking around on a planet. But the first exoplanet, the first planet orbiting around another star, was uh, a planet called 51 Peg B. So Peg is short for Pegasus, which is one of the constellations that you can see in the night sky, and 51 Peg is the name of the star. And that means it's, I think, the 76th brightest star in the constellation Pegasus. And astronomers found this planet um, about 20 years ago. And astronomers had been looking for planets orbiting around other stars. And they thought that other solar systems would be like our own. So they were looking for planets like Jupiter, which is by far the biggest planet in our solar system, orbiting around stars at about the time that it takes for Jupiter to go once around the sun. So Jupiter takes about eight, eight or nine years to go around the sun. So they were expecting to find these big heavy planets like Jupiter taking about eight years to go once around their star. And 51 Peg B was a huge surprise because it's like Jupiter, but it goes round its star about once every five days. And I think it was actually discovered when somebody accidentally typed the wrong number into the computer program they were running. 
And instead of looking for something that took five years, they looked for something that took five days in all of the data they collected. And suddenly they found this signal that they weren't expecting. And so that kicked off an incredibly exciting area of science, exoplanet science, which has just been absolutely full of surprises because we found all sorts of planets that are nothing like anything we see in our solar system, though we are beginning now to find more of the planets that are like the ones in our solar system. I've got a runner up uh, follow up question from Mrs. Dallas's class saying how many planets have been found? Do you know the total number at the moment that it's up to? So I don't know the exact total number because it, it increases every day. Um, so I would guess it's probably up to about 4,500. It's nearly 5,000. Okay, yeah, 5, I'm behind 5, the times. And I was going to say there was a really interesting one that I just saw announced today. It may have been announced yesterday. And this is a third planet orbiting around the very closest neighbour star to the sun. So the very closest neighbour star to the sun is called Proxima Centauri. and just today it was announced that they found a third rocky planet orbiting around that star. So when we look at all of the stars in the sky, it's really beginning to look as though when we make very, very careful measurements, we find planets that are about the same size and mass as the Earth around most of them. So that's really, really exciting, I think. I've got a good question that I think has come through for Eleanor here is when the rover is on the planet, how does it connect to the, back to Earth and move? And how does the, uh, the rover get back to Earth? So what was the first part of the question? So when the rover is on the planet, how does it connect back to Earth and how does it move? Right. OK, so when it's on the planet, it has um, it has pieces of technology and it kind of like what you would have in a mobile phone. Uh, except a lot more powerful, and it connects to satellites that are orbiting uh, Mars. There's, there's a lot of satellites around Mars, and uh, when those satellites move over the planet uh, in a certain way, um, the, the rover sort of talks to the satellite, the satellite collects all that data, and then the satellite waits until it's around the other side of the planet facing the Earth, and then it, the satellite connects with all of the um, really big telescopes and, and data centers on Earth and sends all the data back. So there's a couple of different steps to get data from, from Earth to Mars. Um, and it moves uh, under nuclear power. This is a nuclear powered. It has solar panels as well to charge the batteries to move it, um, but it's not a solely uh, a solar panel, solar powered rover. And it does, it won't ever come back to Earth. It, it will stay on Mars forever. Uh, and hopefully one day when um, humans uh, start visiting the planet, they might find these rovers uh, sort of out on the landscape as, as they start to explore themselves. So it's pretty exciting. Brilliant. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here that I think we've got a couple of answers that come through from Tents Hill Park, which is just across the road from you guys, uh, saying, how many craters are there on Mercury? And why is Venus hotter than Mercury if Mercury is closest to the sun? So I think that's between Annie and Joe. I don't know who wants to go first. Annie, do you want to ask about the answer about the craters first? You're on mute at the moment. No, yes. still on mute. Hello. There you go. Now you are. Hey, there we go. Okay. So yeah, on Mercury, I can answer that part of the question. Um, there are 415 named craters. Um, so when we name craters, uh, we look usually to large ones so that they're greater than about 20 kilometers, which is really quite big. Um, but when we map them, we also map um, the smaller ones, which is anything between five and 20 kilometers. But yeah, 400 and, what should I say, 420 something. <laughs> Okay, so the reason that Venus is hotter than Mercury, that was a really, really good question. And it's actually quite related to what we're doing to our planet at the moment. Um, so it's down to the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect just says 
if you've got an atmosphere, so a shell of gas surrounding the planet, and you'll notice from the pictures of Mercury, Mercury really doesn't have much of an atmosphere at all. It's quite a bare planet. If you've got gas surrounding a planet, it lets through light um, that's in the visible part of the spectrum. That's light that our eyes can see. But there's a different type of light as well called in the infrared. Um, you can see that sometimes if you have a particular type of camera called an infrared camera. And the planet gives out light in the infrared, not in the visible. And atmospheres tend to be quite good at trapping that infrared radiation. So that means the atmosphere acts a bit like an extra blanket for a planet. It's a bit like putting an extra jumper on when you're cold. It's just a bit of insulation. Um, and Venus happens to have an atmosphere that's really, really, really good at insulating. So Venus's atmosphere raises its temperature by about you know, 400 degrees easily, several hundred degrees. It's much, much hotter than we expected Venus to be. Now our planet, Earth, doesn't raise the temperature quite so much. Earth's greenhouse effect is about 30 degrees, which is pretty comfortable. In fact, without our atmosphere, it would be a bit chilly for us. The problem that we have now is that by burning um, gas and oil and coal and wood and things like that, we are releasing more of a particular gas called carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And that gas is actually what Venus's atmosphere is, is almost completely made of. It's really, really good at insulating the planet. So because we're increasing the amount, we're actually increasing that insulation. We're making Earth hotter and that is a problem. So the greenhouse effect by itself isn't a problem. It's the fact that we're making it more efficient, making it better at insulating. That's what the problem is. Brilliant. Right. I'm going to do some very quick fire questions that we've, we've, we've only got about four minutes left. So first question I'm going to ask is coming through from Porter Street. And they're asking, how old were you when you decided that you wanted to be a scientist? So if we do the same, so if we don't we start with Tara and then we go through, if that's OK. Yeah, so I already said I, I decided when I was about 10 years old because I realised I couldn't be an astronaut. Jo? Um, I was 16 after just doing my summer project. Eleanor? I was nine uh, at the cottage staring up at the, the night sky. Wow. Annie? I was probably a bit older as well. I was probably around 16. Um, I, I always did a lot of music when I was younger, so I kind of thought I would end up doing that. But actually, I think having a hobby like music or sport um, can be really useful if you want to do science as well, because it's nice to have those kind of contrasting sides. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely agree. Um, I think this one's a good one. Have any of you discovered the, uh, discovered the planet, Carol? Yes, <laughs> I've, I think I've I've been part of discovering probably about 300. Um, but ones that I was sort of in charge of discovering is only about seven, I think. But I've I've helped with a lot. Still a fair few. Seven is definitely a fair few. Um, we've got two minutes left. Uh, this is the, what is your favourite uh, favourite type of experiment? Does anyone want to jump in on that one? Uh, I like anything that leads to an explosion. Uh, that safe, was one of the questions. Has anyone yeah, a safe, an explosion? A safe explosion. Everyone has to be safe uh, when something explodes, but anything that sort of erupts uh, is something I really like to do. Definitely the best way forward. Um, what have we got left? Are there other, any other dwarf planets out there like Pluto? Does anyone want to ask, answer that one? I mean, certainly yes, but they're very, very difficult to see because the smaller the planet is, the harder it is to find. So I think there's no doubt there will be somewhere. And in fact, there are more dwarf planets even in our solar system than just Pluto. There are several, there's one called Eris, there's one called Maki Maki. Um, so yes, but we haven't found any around other stars just yet. Uh, I've just got one time through from Mr. Totten's class. Has anyone experienced a rocket launch? Has anyone been near it? I've been, I've been to the space shuttle launch. So I was actually in the VIP area for the space shuttle launch, which launched the Hubble Space Telescope. And that was incredible. It was really, really amazing experience. And I was definitely the least important VIP there at that launch and I really really enjoyed it. 
I can safely say everyone in this room is probably incredibly jealous um, of you for that. And I think we're coming up to the end of time, but I'm just gonna ask one last question that's had come through. Does anyone think there's a, a, a alien life out there in any of these exoplanets that we have discovered or we haven't discovered yet? Does anyone want to answer that one? Joe? I'm pretty sure there's something somewhere. Um, I'm less convinced about it being intelligent. I think that's more difficult. But yes, that there, there, there are so many planets. I find it really hard to believe there isn't anything out there. What does Carol think? I, I think I, I agree with you. And I think when you look at the history of life on the Earth, very simple single celled life originated really soon after the Earth was formed. So that suggests it didn't require a lot of very special conditions. So I think that it's very likely that there's very simple life, just kind of slime, really, um, on other planets um, in the galaxy and possibly even elsewhere in our solar system. And I think we might find out about that in the next few decades. So this is a great time to be a scientist. Wow, I think that's a brilliant place to wrap up. It's, it's now three o'clock. I want to thank all of our scientists here for joining us. Hopefully you have learned as much as I have today. Uh, we will hopefully be running another session like this in the future. Uh, we've still got a lot of questions that have come through that we haven't been able to answer. So we may be able to get some videos out for you to answer those, uh, those questions at a later date. Thank you so much for joining us and hopefully you enjoyed it and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.